the black diamonds, but what are the price of oh, price of lives, isn't it? But a man that works down the pit, a miner, you know, it's a long way down to the same is. There is a question of safety. There is a question of health. If one cuts oneself, it sometimes heals by producing a scar. And in the same way, one can imagine these small dust nodules in the lung as, as uh, comprising small scars resulting from a form of damage produced by the dust. Ten hours a day, you're down that hole. You're working coal, you're talking coal, you're eating coal, you're breathing coal. Dust. The first X-ray film is of a 19-year-old and shows a normal chest. It's always dusty. Here are the ribs and these darker areas. The dust was so abnormal that you couldn't see each other. You're just feeling your way about. Passing through these dark areas, there are a few little shadows, and these represent the larger blood vessels, and to some extent... The curse of underground is the dust. Dust is the giant killer, but it doesn't strike all at once, uh, but he likes its time. And he do takes his time, and he stealthily walks into your human system. These represent the earliest signs of pneumoconiosis. He is the real enemy. So minute in his form, and yet so strong in its ravaging powers. We find this category one pneumoconiosis in about 7% of coal workers, taking an average throughout Great Britain. This is a category three pneumoconiosis. Here we see the white spots much more evident than on the earlier film. I've seen victims of this terrible curse, this dust. I've seen victims of it, reduced to nothing. Couldn't breathe, no lungs to breathe. Occurs in about 2.8% of coal miners whom we see. Only the beating of the heart, waiting at that time to be called away. He couldn't walk any more than 10 yards, and he had to stop for breath. It's pitiful to watch him. He even sighed. 10 yards, which have replaced the normal lung tissue. He's got a concrete slab of coal around his bloody inside. That's what he's got. He's probably a chap of 60 year old. He's worked on the pit since he was 15 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old. That's coal dust that he's inhaled while he's working down there. Better when Jack Frost is about. He's got inside his lungs a, a good tombstone of solid coal dust. The east wind kills me. The day from dust. If all the, these our comrades died in one day, then you'd get the press of Fleet Street with its headlines, major disaster. You'd get Lord Mayor's funds and what have you to assist the widows and the dependents. But because they die separately in their own little cottages, just surrounded by their own little families, then uh, there's no press lines, no uh, Lord Mayor's funds, and no sensation. And there is no compensation for it. No compensation can be paid for such a thing as this. Because it is beyond repair. No money will repair it. And it have destroyed an army of the miners. I got four brothers died with it and two stepbrothers. 
died with pneumoconiosis. And yet it's good to come from the pit. Especially after you've been working there, you're tired. Especially in the summer. You say to yourself, life's good. You really feel good to be alive. I can judge a shot of powder to a sixteenth of a grain. I can fill me sixteen tubs, though the water falls like rain. And if you'd like to see me in the perpendicular vein, it's when I'm setting timber in the barroom. In the barroom, in the barroom, oh, that's where we congregate. To drill the holes and fill the coals and shovel back to sleep. And for to do a job of work, I am, am never late. That's providing that we have it in the barroom. A miner has to possess that sense of beauty. A glum face on the ground takes you nowhere. And the gloomier and the glummer you are, you've got to join in. With you were wit, whatever you possess, showing that you were alive and that you were forgetting uh, the outside issues. Well, I don't know, says the manager, it's jobs are in. Nothing much doing here now, is it? Come back in the spring, is it? No, indeed, I don't. I won't hear what the hell you think you are. Two bloody cuckoos. When Isaac Lewis passed away, what do you think they done? Sold him off for anthracite at 20 pounds a ton. <laughs> when did you start it? Same Monday. Said, uh, when it was, he put your lamp in. Said, oh, I don't need a lamp, he said, I'm working days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen, no. Listen to me now, he said. Rome wasn't built in a day. No, he said. But if you were the bloody man, he said, they'd finish it before dinner, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything. Underground without a humor. We can work and we can fight, we can sing and tell a tale. Whether we come from Durham or Northumberland or Wales. Let the cage go down, come on and try the local brew. Join with us and have a few, sit down and tell a tale or two. And if the story isn't true, it's neither here nor there. Let the cage go down, let the cage go down. I want to make you welcome to this 20th gala of the South Wales Miners. This year, we are linking the celebration with the 75th anniversary of the formation of the South Wales Miners Federation. And I will turn the anthracite call as a beacon of life. It's a beacon of light and life. It gives you the light, the colors, and it gives you that necessity which we call heat. It is a beacon of life. Down in the dark, through the peacock seam, through the big vein, through the black band seam. The peacock, the middle, and the lower veins are the best anthracite veins in the world. Down through the four foot, the Cornish, the nine foot, the Bryn and the Welsh vein seam. Now, the seams in South Wales crop from the surface and there was very little need for capital to get into the seam. What was really needed was muscle and sweat. But in the 1920s came machine cutting. That wasn't very acceptable to the workmen in the anthracite. And there was years of trouble and strife to get these machines working. were 
fat and labor cheap. Women on the waste pits scrabbling for coal. Cutters on the coal face, colliers on the dole. If you don't fight, then you don't eat. We've got a record of militancy that has been born out of our struggles. I had a sister living in the valley at that time. And oh, what a sight was to see. Uh, the pride that was there, and yet uh, they were on the verge of starvation. All they had was their pride. And oftentimes, where there was the greatest need, there was the greater pride and an unwillingness to go and seek assistance of any kind. The miner has always had the pride thing. He thinks, well, if he can't make his living by the, by the muscles of his arms and his legs, well, he, he just doesn't want it. That is the reason why uh, miners are so militant in their own cause. They've been taught it from the cradle. I was taught at a very early age that uh, it was like hitting out with a hammer of hate on the anvil of bitterness. Every knock had full power of hate into it. a struggle embracing the all the miners in Britain. And that was the first time in seven centuries of the coal trade that the miners of this country came together